Hey everybody, we're back again. And now take a look at where we're headed. We're gonna see um, Al Collins and automation tools. And this is an interesting story. He actually came to the show for the first time last year and he sold one product, a sander. <clears throat> and it's a hand controlled, hand driven, you crank and you'll see the video in a second, sander. And, and I, as, as I was really taking a close look at it when he was preparing to come on the show, I, I just couldn't believe, I, you know, when you take the time to look at this stuff, it's like, really? This is incredibly cool. And I need one. <laughs> so, uh, and, I, and I actually said to him, where the heck were you last year when I scratch built, or like a year, and it's right before the show, where, before he came up, where the heck were you when I was scratch building 50 buildings for the, for the, uh, uh, the, the Northampton uh, 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 diorama? because that's what I needed it for. And I, honestly, with the, the amount of, of, of building I'm doing now that I've got all this free time, uh, other than this, uh, for the uh, 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 for my Berlin Banger in Maine, I, wait till you see this. I said, I have to have one of these. So I got really crazy about it and they're really cool. And then after I watch that and you'll see, I, I'll, I'll, you know what, I'll leave it at that. Let's go watch that first video and I'll be back and then I'll tell you what happened afterwards. So hit that video. Hi, I'm Jerry Cornwell from Mount Albert Scale Lumber, and I'd like to introduce you to an exciting new tool in the workshop. The most impressive structures on a model railroad are timber structures like trestles, trusses, wharfs, and snow sheds. They're also the most challenging to build. The challenge is to build a straight and plumb structure like this one. Ultimation, a new tool company started by the founder of Mount Albert Scale Lumber, has combined the latest in machine tools and industrial lasers with model building skills to produce the Ultimation Sander. The Ultimation Sander makes it possible to get great results like this, shown on a Hunterline snow shed kit. This kit requires over 700 precise angle cuts. You get tight, precise square joints every time. It features repeatable accuracy within one half of a degree. The rubber disc edge allows fingertip control. It can sand to one one thousandth of an inch accuracy. And a double ball bearing stainless steel hand crank guarantees friction free operation. It uses self adhesive easy to change five inch sanding discs with different grits available. The Ultimation Sander and your creativity a great modeling team. Contact Ultimation and order yours today. Sander, right? The Ultimation tool. So now I look at that sander and I'm thinking, well, wait a minute now. I, I need to repeat parts. And then the son of a gun comes back with another video of how you can add this attachment. And, and for lack of, uh, I'm not using the right term and for, for, forgive me, Al. Uh, but it's uh, it, it allows you to attach this repeater. So let's take a little a bit of a uh, another look at this, guys. Uh, and, and and by the way, Automation Tools. If you go to Automation uh, .ca, because um, Al is from Canada, uh, hence the .ca. Um, uh, you, you'll be able to check out a little bit more. Watch these videos at your leisure again if you'd like. Um, but check out this next video. Uh, it's about eight minutes long, but it is so worth watching because it really shows you how this thing can do precise. And I'm talking precise down to about a, uh, I guess, I, I forget what he says, either a millimeter or a half a millimeter, guys. So this thing is so darn precise. It's what every scratch builder needs, I'm telling you. And it's, it, it's, it's something I got to have. Al, are you listening? I have to have it. <laughs> so let's play that second video. Let's go to it. <laughs> If you're ever building anything, it's a good idea, in my opinion anyway, to do all the parallel stuff first. Because okay. then whatever you're filling in between doesn't change. It's constant. Right, okay. So what we want to do is, um, I'll take these out of the way. I didn't stain these so they maybe show up better. And I wrote master on here and Jerry pointed that out. He said, I'll make a note on your pieces because you keep losing them. <laughs> so, right. The, the, the biggest job is to make the first one. So we're gonna make a master 
which is a perfect fit. Okay, and I'm just going to move these finished ones out of the way so that we can see the new one you're making. All right. So first of all, we're going to go back to junior high days with our plastic protractor, and this oh, becomes right. invaluable. So um, as I said, the tedious part of this whole process is making the first one, the master. So we'll, we'll go on here, we'll get an approximate angle, 35 degrees. Mm -hmm. So now we go to our protractor on here. Right. Sorry. And we set this at 35, 35. degrees. That's a starting point, Thir 35 degrees. Okay. I'll set that over there for now. So okay. I've, I've set 35 degrees on this one. And the reason that I'm bouncing around is that unless you clamp this down or bolt it down, it's going to be bouncing all over. But it also table. has, um, you've got holes at the bottom. You can literally, yeah, yeah bolt this bolt to the workbench. Or a lot of people bolt it to a piece of plywood that's heavy enough. But oh, if you don't, you have to have this secure before you start any yeah. of this. So what we're going to do is we're now going to set the tractor, as I showed you on there, at, let's go to 35 degrees to start with. Okay. Then we will, uh, I've taken some pieces of wood to save time okay. and approximate it. I used a chopper and I just cut an angle on okay. it, whatever. So now I'm going to put this in here. I'm not going to use any of the mechanism on this other than I'm going to use it as a push stick. Oh, okay. So I got that piece of wood in there. Now I'm going to crank this. I can back it up to get rid of the majority of that fuzz. Okay. As you can see now, one of my other favorite um, tools is a scalpel. Not that right. I'm a surgeon. You no. always inherently with a disc sander, you'll get a little bit of fuzz. It's nice to just wave the scalpel over. You don't have to lean on it. Okay. So now we can go back to our drawing. We can lay that on there. And you can see it's open a little on the heel of that angle. Right. It's tight on the... So that means we can go back to our sander now. And just... And we want to take a bit off the toe. Right. So we're going to go up to 37 degrees. Okay. Just a few cranks. Now we're going to put that on. Oh, yeah, that's... And lo and behold... Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Flat. Oh, that's lovely. So we know that's 37 degrees. So we're going to do ourselves a favor. And we then know that this is going to be 37 degrees, too, because of the parallel. Because they're parallel. Right. But we're also going to do ourselves a favor. And write it on there, and right. Just in case. Good idea. So now we know that that's the angle we want. The next thing we need to do is come up with a, with a length. Ah. We do our 37. I've taken another one. I've taken the liberty to make another one. We've done our 37 degrees. I've cut these off fairly tight in length, because if it's out here, you're going to be sanding for half an hour. Right. So you can just lay this on your drawing, mark it, cut it on the chopper, and again, make sure that you get the angles going the right way. Right. So now again, you can use this part as for the initial cut. You can use that part just as a push stick. Right. Way too long. Okay. To save time. So you're going to keep going back until you get it yeah. to the right length. To save time. Okay, here's one if you can see the line. It's close. Yeah. So I'm suggesting that I've got to take about a sixteenth of an inch off. <laughs> this is where the repeater starts to come into its, its, its own. We bring this up now so that this part Right, the you body lock off that into it. the length. We lock that into length. We want to ensure that there's a few threads shown on the back end of this thimble here. Okay. Um, otherwise, there's potential of running out of travel. Okay. Now we know that we want to take about a sixteenth of an inch. So if we can see the gap here between the thimble and the back, we just open that up. There's that sixteenth of an inch that we want to take off. Wow, okay. All right? Now, we just sand until that gets the stop. 
Oh, I see. It closed, so this gap closed the, up here. Yeah, the spring. If it's a little too slow for you, you can help it just with your thumb. Once it stops sanding or hits the stop, well, we can go back. Well, this is almost. Like a, this is like a, so precise. This Almost. is astounding. We still got, you can see in the line, we still got a tiny little bit. So now you have two options. This is the, I've been called too fussy. So now you get two options. You can crank it for that last little bit, or you can simply turn. Oh, yeah. Okay. And turn this with the rubber edge. And we probably only took a few thousands of an inch off. All right, so that's one way of doing it. The other way is the same idea, yeah. except this thimble is gradiated in thousands of an inch. Okay. So something tells me that I want to take five thousands of an inch off that. So there's 20, there's up to, there's about a five thousand of an inch gap in there. Right. Now we're being extremely pernickety just to sort of demonstrate. We now can put that piece in. That is incredible. So that becomes our master. And obviously, if I'm doing 30 of these, I'm going to do these angles all 30 first before I start working yeah. on the other end. Yeah. Okay, got it. So, um, and the way to get around that is once you've established the angle um, and the approximate length that you wanted, you know, we, we worked on a length here, you can set that length up again we'll go back to our 30 and this is where it's so important to keep that 37 degrees because now you can go wherever do whatever and then if you have to come back and make some more you can come back to 37 degrees so here's where we, again we can we can use the repeater so there's our blank length with one angle on it mm -hmm. so now if we needed 500 pieces we could make 500 pieces the same blank length with the first angle on it and we can make all of those that we're going to work with then we can go to the other end as we talked about before and then we just go and put it in and then we can go ahead and take those blanks and put the angles on both ends and get them exactly the right way. That's great. Hey everybody, we're back. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that, uh, that last video, because uh, I sure do, and I did, and I, uh, I, I'm i very impressed by what, uh, what Al is doing. Uh, so next, we have a very long time exhibitor at our show, good friend. Uh, and we're gonna talk to him and say hello just for a, a few minutes. And then we're going to watch something he's prepared for us. So with that, uh, welcome Rick Hunter from HunterLine.com, guys. It's Hunter, it's it's uh, HunterLine uh, products, and, and uh, but I have Rick Hunter with us, and we have uh, Maureen Hooks Hunter as well. Hey guys, hi, hi, how are you? Doing well, Rick. And and uh, first of first a little weather report up there. How you doing up there? Well, can you see in the window out there? Um... A little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's here. laughs> we're, we're supposed to get uh down my way we're supposed to get uh oh anywhere from uh, 10 to 14 inches uh starting uh tomorrow morning so oh, wow. <laughs> we'll see what happens we'll see what happens see, see we're usually oh. away in january and february at train shows and here we are stuck here and it's cold and it's snowy i had to send a snowblower in to get fixed so that we could use oh it gosh <laughs> Yeah, you're usually down with us right about now. Exactly. Second, the second day of the show. Yeah. Rick, tell us a little bit before we go to the video. Tell us a little bit for our, for our viewers. Uh, tell us a little bit what, what, what about what you guys do. Okay, that's what the video is all about. But uh, oh, we, well, we don't want to spoil it, but just give us a little uh, overview. <laughs> we manufacture uh, Craftsman kits in N, H, O, S, and O, and all the narrow gauges. Uh, mostly bridges, uh, trackside structures, and, and so on like that. We also, uh, uh, back when Floco and Poly S and all those guys left us, we started to make our own stains called weathering mix. 
And that is a big, hot product over the past few years. Oh, we great. great. Yeah, I, I, I got to say, when I walk by, uh, I know where you are. Because when I walk by, there's bridges upon bridges. And they're all incredibly gorgeous. They're really nicely done. And I can oh, see that you. you're using your own stains on them and everything. God, Absolutely. they are so realistic. It's beautiful. No, it's good. So, so with that, let's let's because uh, we don't want to spoil anything else. But, but is there anything else that's not uh, before we go to the video, uh, Rick? Anything else you want to talk about before uh, we go there? Well, we we um, it takes us a long time to put something new on the market, okay? And right now we're looking at uh, doing stock pens because we have oh. access to uh, um, uh, round basswood and all the, uh, the strip woods, because everything we do is strip woods from Mount Albert. And, uh, you know, we're trying to decide on the design right now. And then sure. we'll go for it. All right, well, we'll be looking for that. So that's I, great. I should mention, I should mention that um, Al Collins, uh, he, because we're good friends for many, many years, uh, he gave Maureen a sander, one of the prototypes. And really? It was all her comments that urged him to go and produce it. Really? That's yeah, amazing. If you, if you look yeah. carefully in our, our video coming, you will actually see the sander in front of Maureen, and she's kind of using it here. And there. Ah! <laughs> Maureen, who knew? <laughs> That's so cool. I, you know, I love the connection with you folks up there. I, 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 I was, was talking off the air, just so everybody knows, that, that through Rick, uh, you know, an ITLA, and then and then you guys know Al, and Al knows a few other guys, and then and they're all here uh, throughout the the show. So so stay tuned, everybody. But We're let's die hard. Rick, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it, and I and I miss you this year, and I I look forward to seeing you next year. Um, but let's go to that video, and thank okay. you so much for being with us today, Rick. I really appreciate all right. it. All right, Have let's a good hit one. the video. Stay safe. Thank you. You too. Hi everyone, I'm Rick Hunter and this is my fantastic wife, Maureen. Hi everybody. We own Hunter Line from Cambridge, Ontario, Canada. Uh, we manufacture Craftsman kits in N, H, O, S, and O, and O and 30 and some of the narrow gauges too. We've been in business for 26 years. Uh, we like to do shows. We do all the national shows from coast to coast. Uh, in Canada and the United States. We probably do about 20 shows a year when we can do shows, like uh, lately we cannot. We're showing some of our displays at a show. Uh, you can see that uh, we show all scales and some of them get pretty complicated. We'll go into more of that shortly. I'll show you a bunch of our different kits and, and talk a little bit more about the weathering mix as well. At shows, we do a lot of conversing with our customers uh, back and forth. We learn from them and they learn from us. We, Maureen is always at the beginning, at the front table, uh, making one of our kits right in front of you. And you can come back in a couple hours and see how it's progressing or, or sit down and talk about a certain technique or something. We'll be happy to show you. I've learned so much by sitting at that fun table, just sharing techniques and people letting me know their tips. It's It's been great, great experience. We do uh, little clinics at the table as well. We'll, we'll uh, run a little weathering mix clinic, um, show you how to distress wood and how to color it. That's always been a fun thing to do. This is what our kits look like. Uh, we have them color coded. Uh, N is orange, uh, blue is uh, HO, S is yellow, and green is O. We also suggest using S for ON30 because the NMRA specs are exactly the same for those. So we do promote that. This is what our drawings look like. I'm in AutoCAD. Uh, these are very detailed drawings, and they're also used as a template. Okay, so you build all of our kits right on the drawing. 
uh, there's a lot of information there and uh, all the details brought out to you and, and so on. Our instructions are very simple and straightforward. We assume you know nothing about it. Uh, our first page is usually the history and then a couple pages of the methods and techniques and then into the meat of the uh, project that we're doing, uh, both in text and in images. This is some of our house. These are uh, 86 foot and 170 foot and our piers. This is what they look like on a layout. So that's the through bridge and the deck bridge and the pier in the center. This is a little closer picture of it. And this is our 86 foot deck bridge. This uh, is a good example of all the MBWs that we do supply with them. And all the rods are phosphorus bronze rods. And we do supply the drill bit that fits that rod. We build queen post bridges. This is the only kit that we have that is uh, we produce in a standard gauge and a narrow gauge because they are drastically different in sizes. That's what it looks like on a layout. You can see that uh, the shakes on top, uh, these are our own shakes. Uh, they're very prototypical of the time period. Uh, they are random and uh, they look great when they're done. Uh, again, they come in uh, four sizes. The uh, H, O, S, and O are actually solid basswood, where the end scale is actually a birch laminate, because we couldn't get the, the sheets thin enough for end scale. These are our trestles. Uh, there's two different versions, a frame version and a pile version. We also have uh, curved trestles, any of our curved kits can, or any of our trestle kits can be made into a curve. We have very detailed instructions on how to do a curve. Any curve you want. This is what it looks like on a layout. We also produce a snow shed. We're one of the few in the world that actually produces a snow shed. This is uh, mile 24 on the Coquihalla subdivision in British Columbia. This is what it looks like in a layout and on a curve. These are our first two designs, uh, the king post and the queen post. That's what the queen post looks like on a layout. We also produce a tunnel liner. Again, this is off uh, a CPR on the spiral tunnels in British Columbia. We also produce a portal and a retaining wall. The retaining wall can be used uh, for double what you see there, or a lot of little ones or some big ones. Doesn't matter. And there's what the combination looks like the portal, the retaining wall, and uh, going into the snow shed. We also produce a little snow fence. This is a great one night project. Uh, Maureen does all the weathering mix, so we'll pass it on to her to talk about weathering mix. Hi, the second big part of our business is the weathering mix. And uh, it's the base of the weathering mix is 70% isopropyl alcohol. And we mix different colors of leather dye to get the 45 colors uh, that we have. Four of those colors are pigments, and I'll talk a little bit about them a little later on. They're a thicker stain, so different application with that. This is just what it looks like at a at a show. We've got the little samples of wood above the weather mix to show you the different colors. These um, pictures that you're going to see next are customers who sent in models that they've built using our stains. Uh, the weathering mix works on wood, hydrocal, plastic, paper, foam, fabric, um, lots of different things. You just have to use your imagination. To find out more specifics as to how to apply it, you can go to our website and look at the YouTube there on uh, weathering. This one is a 3D printer crawler, which is uh, out of paper. So this um, this person used sandalwood brown, light gray, and dark brown to get the effect that you see. Looks pretty great. And here's a plastic rail car. Um, this person used a creosote black to just dry brush on different areas to highlight the uh, rivets and the boards that you see there. It really turns that simple, straightforward, plain looking box car into a really nice, nicely weathered car, which doesn't take much time at all. Here it is used on wood, on basswood. There's a little yellow structure there that's using our yellow cream and they've uh, weathered it with our light brown. They've dry brushed a little bit of light brown here and there under the eaves and up from the bottom. 
and the wall adjacent to that yellow building is boxcar brown and they've used sandpaper to kind of take away some of that stain to give it that weathered look and the little building below the yellow cream one is made with our hunter green and golden brown was used to do all the framing and light gray for the uh, stairs this is another structure, the coaling structure, where, where driftwood was used as a base coat and then someone used the creosote black to darken up the areas where you'd find the grime and grease and sooty areas that you find on trackside structures. So it really, really brings it to life. Here's another uh, neat little structure. Um, this person used driftwood, blue, gray, and raw sienna. And you can see the individualized colors in the strip wood, which really looks great. And you can use it on rock, hydrocal, plaster. Um, this you can, these structures you can use our pigments. We have cottage white cement shale that you can put on the structure first and then wipe it off with a sponge or paper towel. It really looks great for mortar lines. And then this fellow used uh, medium brown and golden brown to do the different colored rock variations. You can use light gray, creosote black, whatever. Someone here has sent in an oil painting where they used our sky blue pigment, which is the thicker stain, and they use that for the sky and the water. Here's a styrene structure that was stained with PT green, and then the basement um, structure there with the strip board is uh, Cordovan brown. It looks like with some dry brushed areas of creosote black. Here's our covered bridge. Um, the shakes really turn out well. I've used a driftwood as a base color and just adding some dry brushing with Cordovan Brown and Creosote Black. And again, the side wall of the, of the uh, covered bridge is a light gray coat as a base coat, dry brush with Barn Red and Creosote Black. And this is our tie stringer assembly using driftwood, tie brown, and Cordovan. I just use different colors for different ties and apply them haphazardly and cover with a black wash and that's it thanks for watching thanks for watching you can uh, go to our website for further information or get in touch with us and have fun hey everybody we're back and, uh, and one more shout out to rick and maureen from hunterline I uh, really appreciate it. And the video was great. So Rick, lots of stuff going on for you. Um, so I really appreciate the time you spent with us today. And, uh, and I mean, I'll see you next year. I miss you. We'll see you next year. Hey, next up, everybody, is we're going to talk JMRI. Got to talk JMRI. It's so prevalent these days. It's out there. It's really important. But let me, let me just tell you a little story. About four years ago, I was doing a uh, spot the week before the show, uh, for uh, uh, PBS on um, on the Springfield, uh, Massachusetts station. Uh, it turns out one of the producers there is a big model railroader <laughs> and he's no longer there. So we, you know, my airtime is, uh, is, is dwindled. But we were on this, uh, we were on one of, uh, you know, it was like daytime half hour show, right? So we're on this segment uh, and, and this wonderful, and I forget her name, unfortunately, but, but she starts asking me questions and, and I was with Dick Joyce, uh, who was a, a past president and we were both chatting it up about the show and the hobby. And, and then all of a sudden she lays on me. So what's all this I hear about JMRI? She goes, what does JMRI stand for? And I said, where did this come from? So afterwards, I said, boy, I guess you did your, I might have even said it on the air. I said, you've been doing your homework, haven't you? So guys, we're talking about Java Model Railroad Interface. So I was, God, she, but she caught me by surprise. I said, oh my God, if I blow this, but, but it all worked out well. So anyways, part of the group that was already coming to the show uh, the uh, modelers, uh, Central New York modelers, they were back then the Central Modeler, New York Modelers of Distinction because it is so distinct, their layout. Uh, you would love it. Um, and, and they still actually come to the show and they're in the Stroh building and they are really the anchor layout there. But anyways, one of the folks associated with them was a guy by the name of Ken Cameron. And he is one of the original, and I always get this wrong, Ken, so I, I apologize. I, 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 so I put a bunch of, bunch of words, founder slash consultant slash author, et cetera. But he was early involved with JMRI guys. And so he shows up at the show with the guys, but he has his own table now. And he does talk about JMRI. He does an update clinic for us every day. He does one on Saturday, one on Sunday. So he really does a lot of 
uh, uh, of, of talking. Uh, inter- it's like a live uh, support group. And he's right there. So we built a big sign for him and it says questions, JMRI, uh, have them answered here or something along those lines, but it's a giant sign we built for those guys. And, and so a big shout out to Ken for, um, uh, for what he's done for us in the past. I had the opportunity of going up to the uh, Albany, no, not Albany, uh, Syracuse, sorry, the Syracuse show uh, at one of the state fairgrounds up there. And um, the uh, Beltlines exhibit. So I said, hey, let's take a trip with the Beltlines and see what's going on and see who's up this way. And of course, all these guys were up there. And I got an opportunity to um, operate on a layout that Ken was the dispatcher. And it was all using JMRI and all of the associated uh, parts of that. So I said, Ken, what can we do for this show? So guys, do me a favor, jump over to your um, uh, uh uh, page, uh, the landing page for when you start where it shows all the time, et cetera. And when you head all the way down to the time slot we're in now, 1130, Ken is on the air in his own Zoom meeting. You could see the link right there. Thank you, Greg. And you could actually click on that and join that meeting. It's just like we talked about the other day, walking by his table and saying, hey, I have some questions for you. So go one-on-one with one of the, one of the perfect guys to talk about JMRI. And, and before we, we, we leave you uh, and let you do that, because I want you to spend that time, he'll be on the air for a full half hour, if not longer, guys. So you'll have until just afternoon, and depending on how many people show up, uh, and we leave that up to Ken, but uh, we'll be able to do that. But let's, well, one other thing I want you to see is go to the list of exhibitors, all right? Head on down to the J's, alphabetically, and you'll see Ken Cameron and jmri.org, the website, and you'll be able to see what's going on there as well. And Ken can obviously talk to you about any of these things, guys, Decoder Pro, Panel Pro, Dispatcher Pro, which is what he was working on uh, at that layout where we uh, uh, we operated on, which was a lot of fun, and I took a lot of pictures too, by the way, and all kinds of stuff. So all, all and you can even download the JMRI program. That's one of the first sub portions of the menu up at the top, get the latest and greatest and all of that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to, um, now that we've talked about this, I'm going to, I'm going to let this time go for, um, of people that want to have the zoom meeting directly with Ken. So it's kind of like me standing out of the way. And while we do that, um, we're going to buzz over to guys, LaGrange, Kentucky, which is a true street railroad. The, the railroad comes right down the middle of the street. So we're going to rail cam over to LaGrange and see what's going on. So don't forget to go to that link uh, that's in the uh, time slot for 1130 on Sunday. Join Zoom, talk to Ken, do what you do, what you, uh, you know, ask any questions, do what you need to do. Uh, he'll be there for you. Uh, and in the meantime, we're going to head on over to LaGrange. Let's hit it to LaGrange, guys. Let's go see that street railroad.
Hey guys, uh, Mike Sear, Virtual Railfan. Uh, we're currently watching LaGrange, Kentucky. Uh, and in the interest of time, it's, it's a really neat uh, location. We'd really like for you guys to see a, a train. So um, bear with me here. You know, we're currently live now, but in just a second, I'm gonna scrub through the video and see if we can go back and uh, find a train for you guys to actually watch. Uh, we'll let that train go by and then we'll go back to the live shot. Um, just so you guys can see, it's a real neat, you know, if, if you're not uh, regular viewers, it's just a, a neat, uh, neat little town. And of course, uh, pretty unique with the, the railroad coming down the center of the street. So uh, back to the video and we're going to find us a train.
Hey, everybody, we're back. And, and Mike, thanks. And what a great call to roll that back and let everybody know that you're going to show a train going down the center of the street. Uh, I, I understand, guys, it's a 10 mile an hour speed limit for the head end. And as soon as the head end is out of town, they, they get the gear up towards uh, up to 25 miles an hour because by then people realize the train is obviously there. How can you miss it? Um, but uh, very interesting. So next, next stop, guys. We, we have a video of um, one of the home layouts. It happens to be my favorite home layout to operate it on, uh, only because it's like 99% scenic. Um, it holds a lot of people. We have had op sessions with 20 to 25 people, even more for uh, on record nights. Uh, it's centrally located, so we all could get to it. Um, not only that, the guy happens to be my good friend. And let me tell you, you know me in movies, right? Did you ever see the movie movie uh, Sliding Doors? You know, uh, it takes place in, in England, and and uh, there's two scenarios running side by side, and, and, and it's all about did the woman catch the train? Uh, in one case, she catches the train. In another case, she misses the train. And so it's two movies running side by side, kind of interwoven. What happens if you're in the right spot at the right time? And, and, and that's, the, that's, that's the kickoff to this. What we're talking about here is, uh, I forget when it was, but it was back, it might have been back when uh, they uh, had the regional in Boston, I think. I can't remember. I'll get yelled at later, I'm sure. But um, uh, what happened was my house, uh, my layout was open uh, for an open house. And right when I was ready to close, I do remember that part, uh, these two guys showed up. And one of them was a guy I knew from the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, his name was Dick Joyce. And he showed up and I said, where have you been? Because now this is like mid 90s. So, so we're talking like a lot of years. And, and one thing led to another. He said, come up. I've got a new layout. Meet the guys. And that's how I got hooked into the Amherst Railway Society. So had it not been for Mr. Joyce... I would not be here today. I'm, I'm, I'm serious because one thing led to another, led to another, led to another, led to you're going to be the show director until you die. And, and, and so here we are. So, Dick, thanks, I think. But having said that, let's run this video. Um, and, 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 and we're talking about, guys, in, in an area where Dick Joyce grew up. And the name of the railroad is the Engleside and Oakdale. We are going to start from where Massachusetts, which is an add-on because we made him add this on. We keep expanding this layout uh, and, and we're going to turn his house into a club. Uh, he doesn't know it yet, but we're going to do that. Um, and, and because so many people have been working on this railroad, Dick has very little say in what happens to his railroad. And, and I think his, his wife, Nancy, has more say than he does as far as where we could go and where we could expand to. Of that, I'm sure. Right, Dick? Right, Nancy? <laughs> so what's happening here, guys, is we're taking off in Ware, Massachusetts. We're going to travel over the entire road uh, at a reasonable speed. It's an 11-minute video. But when you're operating at that uh, layout, it takes a good hour to an hour and a half to run over the railroad because we're running 30 35 trains a night, locals, express, passenger trains, extras. So it's a lot of fun. Dispatch controlled. Phone it in because of the time frame that Dick likes to operate on. So you have to stop at a phone station, call the dispatcher on a phone. This is my phone. Can you see? And 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 and, and radio in and uh, no radios and, and call in. I beg your pardon. All right. And then um, when this is over, I'll be back and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, – uh, uh, these kinds of films in general. So roll it, guys.